Welcome back. Our next speaker is um, Christy Wang, a Wen from uh, Exeter. Okay, thanks very much. I just realized I don't have my name on the slide. So, <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, welcome back from the break. Uh, so I couldn't resist showing this video, even though it won't be uh, what I will focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, so this is actually a failed experiment where we were looking at some larvae of some corals and we actually left the petri dish too long, um, sitting outside at 30 degrees. And this is actually what we saw in a few hours after. Um, so you can see this development of, um, I think you can call it a microbial community, which involves many, many different species that are mostly at this point unidentified. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, it's important to note that these are all uh, moving. So that's what I mean by motility, and it's maybe a bit different from um, the other topics uh, over the course of this um, workshop. Okay, so um, recently I came across this review paper. Uh, so you may have heard of a tree of life, but maybe you haven't heard of a tree of motility. Um, but this is quite a remarkable paper where people, these, these um, researchers really condensed or did a really comprehensive survey uh, of all the possible motility mechanisms that exist on Earth. Um, and most of these, well, may, maybe some of these that you're familiar with, such as bacterial motility, um, but there are some more exotic mechanisms, such as um, how these organisms glide on surfaces. Uh, and I know some people in the audience are working on these mysterious mechanisms. Uh, and then, of course, there are also eukaryotes. Um, I like how in the grand proportion of things, um, you have the eukaryotes down here and then the humans are just a tiny, tiny uh, bit of this massive space. Um, so around this time, uh, this was obviously lockdown and everybody was writing reviews. And so we had to get uh, on it as well. So we were thinking about this problem from a slightly different perspective. Uh, so this is one of eukaryogenesis. Uh, so what is what is happening at that beginning where you have um, this transition from prokaryotic life or prokaryotic means of living into this kind of more, what we like to think as more complex eukaryotic uh, mechanisms. So these are typically what one would associate with um, prokaryotic motility. So this is again bacterial flagella, run and tumble, locomotion, uh, but also archaea, uh, which operate in a very different way from bacterial flagella, but uh, from if you were a physicist, you might be forgiven into thinking that they are identical. Um, so, and then around here, we have all these other uh, mechanisms that are exclusively eukaryotic um, that are maybe very diverse and complex, and you have all kinds of um, things such as mating and fusion and prey capture. Um, and this, again, is all happening at the level of individual cells, uh, which was quite a surprise, uh, at least to me. Um, and coming at it again from uh, a physical perspective, I mean, they say that um, nothing can be understood except in the light of evolution. Uh, but it turns out that evolution can't be understood except through the lights of physics. So this is where we are. And what this uh, simple sort of phase diagram tries to illustrate is that if you take all the species on, well not all the species, but all the species that we care about at the microscopic scale. So most of these are unicellular organisms, uh, but it also includes things such as, uh, such as immune cells or uh, keratocytes or um, individual cells that are um, exclusively eukaryotic. And we place them in this uh, phase diagram comprising the size of the cell um, in log scale versus its swimming speed. Uh, I call it a swimming speed, even though obviously some of these species aren't actually swimming. Um, and what's interesting is that you can start to segregate the space space into uh, distinct, distinct rate genes. So for example, you have this so-called Reynolds number. There are two uh, dimensionless numbers on this graph here. So you have a Reynolds number here and also a Peclet number. Uh, so the first number dictates this ratio between viscosity and inertia. You can think of it as uh, if Reynolds number is high, then if I were swimming, I mean, this is high Reynolds number movement. But um, for a single small organism at the microscopic scale, even if you're swimming in water, uh, what this means is that the world looks very much to be uh, a highly viscous um, world. And so all of these organisms cluster below this uh, Reynolds number equals one line. So it's low um, 
high viscosity, viscosity dominated. And then this Peclet number, which characterizes the ratio between diffusion and advection. Um, so this means that if you are above Peclet number equals one, if you start to vigorously agitate your appendages, if you have appendages, um, this allows you to really enhance nutrient uptake. Uh, but if you're below this line, then there's not very much point in doing that because diffusion is just as good. Um, so that's kind of the, the physical constraints. And it turns out that uh, most eukaryotic organisms, eukaryotic cells, so when you think of eukaryotic chemotaxis, uh, so cells kind of crawling around on the substrate, uh, so they, they tend to cluster in this regime where they're fairly large cells, but they move fairly slowly. Um, meanwhile, bacteria and other sorts of prokaryotic organisms tend to access this stochastic navigation regime where it's, everything is very noisy and movement is highly um, sort of dominated by diffusion. Um, whereas if you're just slightly larger, uh, so the difference between say a bacterium and a chlamydomonas cell, and I was glad that chlamydomonas was mentioned already in the conference, um, is, is only a, a tenfold increase in size. Uh, but this actually leads to a 1000 fold decrease in rotational diff diffusivity. Um, so this means that the cell such as chlamydomonas can really control its swimming trajectory, its movement trajectory. Um, so this, together with the evolution of cilia and many other cellular in innovations that we consider in this review, really allow these cells um, to have better control over how they interact with their environment. And in particular, this is manifest in uh, mechanisms such as phototaxis. Uh, so these cells really migrate towards light in a very deterministic way. Um, but of course, um, in biology, there are many counterexamples, and we tried to list some of these counterexamples here. Uh, so even though most bacteria um, are only big enough to access the stochastic regime, it turns out that there are some peculiar species, such as this theovolum, uh, which is this giant bacterium, um, about 600 microns in size, and it's so big that it can actually do um, equivalent, something equivalent to eukaryotic um, chemotaxis in this case. Uh, but I won't dwell on this. So the idea of this presentation today is to give you uh, hopefully three different um, case studies. Uh, so these are three different examples of organisms that we have in the lab. Uh, so we have a lot of organisms in the lab. Um, and this includes uh, essentially three different scales, not really in order. Um, so we have swimming, um, in this case driven by this uh, unicellular alga. Uh, you can think of it as Chlamydomonas-like, but it's a marine species, it's not a, a freshwater species. It also does phototaxis, but we don't understand how. Um, but what it's, it is quite unique is that each cell has precisely eight cilia. So these are, I'll say cilia and flagella interchangeably um, in, in this talk. Uh, you can count them, there are definitely eight. You can check the entire population and the, each cell really has eight flagella. And, and then there are other organisms, these are known as diatoms, it's just one characteristic diatom that we have in the lab. I've really sped up this video and disguised the time lapse, uh, the timestamp, um, so that you can imagine they're very fast gliders, but actually they're very, very slow. And they can be, um, if you weren't patient enough, you might think that, uh, oh, they're not moving. And in fact, a lot of literature um, states that diatoms are not motile, but actually diatoms are, a lot of diatoms are motile if you wait long enough. Um, so these are moving at approximately 10 microns per second. Um, and then finally, here is where I'm really stretching the definition of microbial here. This is a coral larva. It's an animal larva. It's a marine organism, obviously, um, but it's uh, fully ciliated. You can't really see it in this SCM, but it's covered in cilia. Um, but I highlighted some trajectories for you so that you can appreciate they are highly motile creatures. Um, but nonetheless, they are uh, useful models for us to understand what is it, the, the, really the physics and uh, mathematics of movement control at this scale. Um, so a talk earlier actually touched on using technology to help us understand how these organisms interact with their environment. Um, because real communities are so complex and multi-dimensional, multi-species, that 
they're very difficult to understand. We thought, let's just start with a single cell in a single well and see where we get, um, where we get to. So here is just one example. I mean, this is nothing new, as in conceptually, it's nothing new. Many people have been putting different animals inside arenas. Um, so whether it's uh, flies or fish or whatever, as long as it's, it's small enough, you can confine it in a tank or confine it in a space and just observe its movement behavior over um, long periods of time. So that's what we wanted to do. Uh, so we created these microfluidic devices, which is chips um, out of PDMS, and such that we can encapsulate individual cells. Oh, well, this was a movie. Encapsulate individual cells inside these uh, little traps. Um, so these are quasi um, two dimensional so that uh, the, the, they're very shallow essentially. And then we can change different aspects such as the size of these traps uh, or other um, factors. Uh, and principally we wanted to compare two species, this Chlamydomonas um, cell that has precisely two cilia um, with this Pyramidomonas octopus, this marine species, uh, which has th these eight cilia. So what do they do? Uh, so in the case of the marine species, this is what you might see, depending on the size of these confining chambers. Um, so it turns out that, so I haven't, um, uh, I've just increased the size of the video so that, they, uh, that they're the same, but obviously the size of the trap itself is decreasing. Um, so you can see a change in the behavior as a, a function of um, trap size. Uh, in particular, in the smallest of traps, these cells become increasingly confined. Um, so I'll just play that video again. Um, so you can see that there are some strange aspects to this behavior. It's not a continuous movement mechanism. It's highly stochastic. These cells fluctuate between fast movement, um, episodic movement, and periods of inactivity where it's basically stationary. And then it um, shocks, as it's known. So um, in these heat maps, uh, we can essentially try to measure how behavior changes over time uh, over different confinement sizes across the population. And by population, it's a very small population of only five different individuals per condition. Um, but these five individuals have been each been assayed over these extraordinarily long uh, times. Uh, so this is a lot of high speed imaging data that we had to analyze in order to generate these um, heat maps. Uh, so where this, the color essentially is an indication of the average speed, average instantaneous movement speed. Uh, so the fast episodic movement you can see as uh, the blips in the signal. Um, and if you take a Chlamydomona cell and a octopus cell, uh, you can compare the different uh, distinct movement signatures. Um, so not only in terms of the path um, morphology, which we can go more into if you like, but simply in terms of speed. So if you just measure speed as a time series, you see that Chlamydomonas moves fairly continuously, albeit stochastically. Um, whereas this Perimonas octopus, really, if, if I didn't tell you what this was, you might think this was neurons firing or something. Um, so this is high, highly reminiscent of this uh, active, um, highly active control mechanism, um, something inside the, this, motility network that allows it to access these different states. Okay, so we can, of course, take these trajectories and do many types of measurements. Uh, so typically, you might think about um, mean squared displacement curves, or you can think of tortuosity or other well-known measures in the literature. Uh, but what we really wanted to understand was what is the influence of time in this, um, in this system? So if we take our trajectory, um, we can coarse grain space, physical space, into all these um, sort of equal size grids and just ask simple questions such as how likely am I to be in any position at any given time? And moreover, how likely am I to go somewhere else at any given time? Uh, so that's what, this is what these flux diagrams are trying to show. So in blue, we have the um, probability of staying in that pixel at any, uh, so average over all time. Uh, so you can see that this is what happens as a function of the trap size. Um, and then these arrows are basically what, how you would compute this flux direction. Uh, so what this means is that you count up um, essentially the number of times that you go from the current pixel to the left or to the right or up or down. Um, and then this gives you 
across all data points, an average direction which is also associated with um, a strength. So if this arrow is long, it basically means that you're highly likely to go from uh, one pixel to another. And if it's short, then it's obviously uh, the opposite. And what we didn't expect to find is this emergence of chirality in the system, uh, which you kind of see from the videos as well. But this confirms that the long time, the time averaged behavior exhibits chiral circling movement, uh, which you don't see in the largest, largest traps. Um, so the cells are always going in the same direction uh, around, around this boundary. Um, and what's even more peculiar is that when we switch the illumination light from red light, which um, most photosynthetic organisms are fairly insensitive to, uh, to white light, which is broad, broad spectrum white light, just like sunlight, uh, the direction of the chirality reverses. Uh, so that was very curious. We didn't expect to see the chirality in the first place, and let alone something that can flip depending on um, this environmental factor. Um, so we spent a long time thinking about this, and I think we finally understood how this happens, but I'm happy to discuss um, more later. So uh, the basic idea is that we, uh, around the same time, um, there was another uh, study which came to the opposite conclusion um, compared to what we did. So the idea is that in a trap that has um, curvature gradients, such as an ellipse, um, a sort of model swimmer that looks like a Columbia Dimona cell like this uh, should not produce, sorry, should produce fluxes on average. But if the chamber were entirely circular, then you shouldn't see any fluxes on average. And yet we have circular chambers and we see fluxes on average. Um, so how do we reconcile this? So in, in the previous model, um, the idea is that you can take your, uh, our lack of knowledge of these organisms and just distill it into two spheres of different sizes. So this is based on a sort of active Brownian particle model. Um, so these spheres, one for the body, one for the flagella, because the flagella span a much larger space than the body. Um, and then this is the source of this asymmetry that essentially leads to um, unequal interactions with the wall. Uh, so in this case, you simply have some equation that uh, is, consists of a self-propulsion term, um, consists of a potential which dictates what happens when the cell, when the particle gets to a wall and plus some noise. And every time it gets to a wall, it can be stochastically reoriented by these interactions. And all these data points, uh, sorry, all these parameters can also be extracted from um, the existing literatures, so existing measurements of what is the size of the organism and how often does it interact with um, boundaries, etc. Uh, so what is the modification that is required? Um, it turns out that we just need to create a bias one way or the other. Um, so we take our dumbbell model that has this four aft asymmetry and add an additional axis of asymmetry. So this time in the bilateral sense. Uh, so if your flagella spheres um, is slightly offset from the body sphere by some small angle, so even just one degree will suffice, uh, this will bias the, the net movement trajectories um, over time. Uh, and it does so in a way that is consistent with the observations that basically the smaller the confinement, the greater uh, the wall effect will be, and therefore the greater these fluxes uh, that, that emerge. Um, and so how do we explain uh, the flipping of the chirality? So it turns out we just need to bias it in, a, in the opposite way, which is logical. But what is happening for the cell? Um, so it turns out that these organisms although they have two cilia that look morphologically similar to each other, um, they're not identical. And this is, we think, uh, the origin of phototaxis, uh, which requires a certain bias in the movement. Um, so what we think is happening is that the cell, depending on the local environment, such as the wavelength of the illumination, um, will bias the symmetry of its two cilia in a different way. Um, so if you just imagine a, a two-dimensional case, uh, then the cell will beat faster with its left flagellum when, when the light is red. And when you flip to white light, it moves its right flagellum a bit more. Um, so left and right is obviously uh, not quite the correct 
uh, terminology in this case because it's a three-dimensional object. Uh, but this is this is what we think is happening. Oops. Okay, so that was really about the macroscopic scale. Uh, so how does the long-term trajectories manifest itself uh, from these recordings? Uh, but what about the cell internal signaling? Um, and how do we access that? Um, so one way to make progress is to really think about discretizing the space of all possible motility mechanisms. Um, so if you take a trajectory, you saw that <clears throat> some of these cells will be swimming, others will be stationary. And if you follow this, the life history of a single individual, you'll find all three things as well. Uh, so really, we wanted to measure uh, the likelihood of each of these states, but also the likelihood of transitioning between these states. Um, so if you think about a trajectory, you might find the stop states or the run states or the tumble states. And equivalently, uh, in the other species, you have the stop, shock, and run states. And so you can discretize trajectories in the following way, and then create these reaction networks. Uh, so essentially networks that describe interactions between probability, um, transition probabilities between states, pairwise um, transitions between states. So what is the probability of staying uh, in a run or tumble or stop? And how, how often do you transition between them? Uh, and then it turns out that you can use this not only to um, assay in a very objective way how these, how these behaviors change over time, but also how different species differ in terms of their motility patterns, uh, but also you can apply different environmental conditions such as um, compare red and white light and see how these uh, probabilities change. So one, I won't go into too much detail, but one striking feature is that in um, red light, the stop probability for the octopus cell is quite stationary, whereas um, in red light, uh, sorry, other way. So in red light, the stop probability is very stationary, but in white light, there's a really, there's an increase in the likelihood for the cell to stop. Um, and in fact, we find that uh, this coincides with an increase in probability for the cell to, to stop moving to, um, or a reduction in the run probability, if you like. Okay, so we can take all of these measurements and um, apply different conditions, but one different uh, one particular assay that we wanted to conduct uh, which isn't really possible in the previous um, microfluidic device is, is something we dubbed de deterministic fusion but all it is is that we wanted to perturb the chemical environment around a single individual instantaneously um, so you might have heard of uh, chemotaxis assays chemotaxis chambers in the context of bacterial motility um, but those tend to be bulk measurements, which uh, often disguises what is happening at the individual cell level. Uh, so in this experiment, all we're doing is fusing or trying to fuse inside these doublet microwells, one droplet that contains a cell with another droplet that contains your perturbing agent. Um, and then by changing the surface chemistry, uh, we can induce deterministic fusion, if you like, between these droplet pairs. So this is what, as just proof of principle, this is what happens. So this is an octopus cell on one side of this doublet, uh, and then we fuse the, the two wells, and you see that its behavior is instantaneously perturbed. Um, so I think this is, that there's a lot that we can do with this apparatus going forward, uh, but I won't go into the details. Okay, so um, the second movement mechanism um, is quite surprising because it doesn't involve any appendages. And if you just observe it under the microscope, um, this is a motile diatom might be creating these trajectories as shown here. Um, and each of these cells actually is known to move uh, along its so-called RAFE. Um, and at the same time, it produces these, it secretes these strange polysaccharides uh, or sort of glue-like substance um, that some people in the past thought really resembled jet propulsion. Uh, so there are many papers, if you dig through the literature, that argue uh, how do diatoms move? It must be by jet propulsion. Uh, but obviously, if you know anything about uh, fluid physics, this is not possible because 
a lot, the Reynolds number of the system is extremely small. Um, so forget about jet propulsion. Um, but we don't actually understand how it moves. And we think, so the most likely, most plausible explanation really is that it relies on a sort of actin myosin system. Uh, so there are these actin cables that underlie uh, the structure, this diatom structure, and you have myosins that really walk along these cables. And somehow, through a mechanism that we're currently investigating, this allows this whole cell to then glide on the substrate. And this is all I wanted to show to this audience. Um, depending on the species, you can actually have very different movement trajectories. And they look very different without doing any quantification. And one might ask questions such as, what is the purpose of these differences? Does it make, does it ensure that each species um, is able to move a slightly different distance from another species and why? So maybe some species, depending on their ecological niche that they inhabit, uh, maybe they don't need to, to move very far. Whereas maybe other, organisms, other species that need to vi migrate either upwards in three dimensions or in two dimensions, maybe those need to move in a mo more efficient manner. Um, so for example, again, just very quickly go through this. If you watch a diatom, um, you can again decompose its trajectories, its motility states into a discrete number of states. So rather than having three, as we did previously for the flagellates, we can instead have something like four. And the whole point of this is that you can again compute transition probabilities between states and use these assays to, to um, distinguish between uh, different organisms, different species, uh, and different environments. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I just wanted to go uh, to the last situation, the last uh, type of organism. So these are, again, these here, these are single-celled organisms that have many, many more cilia than just um, a countable number, really. So here you can see that these cilia can form um, complex hierarchical structures such as rings or bands. And here they can also exhibit these um, waves of activity. So these are known as metachronal waves. So this is very similar to what happens in a football stadium. Sometimes I'm told um, where, <laughs> uh, where there is in the absence of any sort of central control mechanism, uh, as long as you can see your neighbor and what your neighbor is doing, this is sufficient to generate these propagating waves of activity. Uh, so I promised you about something about the corals. So in the case of corals, so this is nothing surprising because many marine invertebrates have at least a motile stage. So mostly uh, during the larval stage, for example, when they need to um, disperse and uh, resettle somewhere else and colonize a different space. So here, for example, is the stony coral, uh, which produces motile larvae <coughs> over a very short period of the life cycles. And these larvae look essentially like ellipses. They're not quite spheres, so unfortunately not very spherical cow-like. Uh, apologies to some physicists. And on the surface of these larvae, um, you can identify these quasi-hexagonal arrangements of cilia, uh, which these individual monociliated cells then contribute to the global motility of the organism. And this is what it does. Uh, so we can, uh, these particles that you see around it are just uh, tracer microspheres that allow us to visualize the um, nature of the fluid flows around this individual. Um, but the larva itself is sort of teardrop shaped when it's swimming. Um, and it's rotating as well around its own axes as it swims. Uh, so this is something, um, a sort of simple measure of the flow field around one of these larvae, uh, where the, the color again indicates um, high, so high sort of blue means low speed and red means high speed, just like a heat map. Um, and it's not particularly well sort of described by, by known physical um, entities. But the agreement between uh, this type of picture and, and just a simple sort of squirmer model is not too bad. So it's good enough that we can then approximate the swimming dynamics using some known physics, fluid physics. Uh, so I won't go into the details of this, uh, but what we also wanted to study 
was the coordination on the surface of these individuals. Um, and just to give you another high-speed movie, this is what the beat of an individual cilium on the coral ectoderm looks like. Um, and this is hand traced because despite how much we tried, it was impossible to do it um, automatically. Uh, but you can really appreciate that uh, it's a very highly densely ciliated surface. But um, despite this, there is stereotypy inside um, in, the, in the movement pattern of each individual cilium. So we can take these movement patterns and um, digitize it and simplify it uh, so that we can then input this into a computer simulation. And long story short, um, the orientation of the wave uh, was something we were able to deduce from experimental measurements, um, in particular that if you imagine you have this sort of ellipsoidal shape, uh, the wave propagates transversely uh, to the direction of the power stroke of the cilia. Um, so that in other words, this is known as a diaplectic metachronal wave. And if we then input the cilia beat that we obtained from the experiments and put it in a configuration that as closely that closely resembles what happens in real systems, then you get something that looks like this. Um, and then we can compare the measured flow signatures that you obtain from the simulation from what, compare that with what we get from our PIV measurements. And, and there's also good agreement. Uh, but in, interestingly, you can also, because it's a simulation, access regimes of parameter space that you can't do in an experiment. So for example, you can then modulate uh, this wave direction that we call alpha. Uh, so the, the sort of direction between the propagation direction and the beat direction uh, and see how, and sweep through dif different parameters to see how the efficiency of propulsion, or actually in this case, the efficiency uh, of pumping of fluid changes as a function of alpha. Um, and then you find that actually a diaplectic metachronal wave, uh, which is, you can think of it as either pi over two or three pi over two, depending on which direction it is, is very nearly optimal um, for, for this pumping efficiency. Um, so it is always more preferable to have a wave if you're trying to um, enhance efficiency in this context. And I think this really explains why metachronal waves are so common in ciliated systems. Okay, so this is my final slide uh, with this kind of uh, optimistic um, summary of what I hope I've communicated today. So is this, firstly, obviously, motility is challenging. So whenever you have something that is moving, the, the, uh, when your study subject is moving all over the place, this presents both technological and um, conceptual challenges to how you should study them uh, in a way that eliminates bias as much as possible. Um, and it's only by doing this that we can then obtain or attempt to create more mechanical models of how these um, organisms interact with their surroundings, interact with their environment. And I think I didn't dare to put this as a fifth bullet point, but once we understand all of that, then we can start to look at community interactions. So um, but that's maybe a in eight years time. Okay, so this is um, my acknowledgement slide. So I thank my current uh, group members, particularly the people highlighted in bold, um, and then the funding and collaborators. And thank you for your attention. Thanks for this beautiful talk, Christy. So any questions? Yes. The two okay. cilia. Yeah. Does that vary across Yeah. Um, I think at the moment it's very difficult to, to have enough resolution in the experiments to really uh, see what that alignment looks like. So we have some evidence from whenever the cell happens to be swimming in the field of view, but in reality the organism moves in three dimensions. Um, so whenever you're capturing uh, a snapshot. You can only ever see a snapshot. It's very difficult to follow 
uh, the whole sort of its whole its movement in three dimensions, as it were. But I think it's um, one of the next things to do is really to uh, try and design a better experiment uh, that can really let us maybe perturb that bias um, actively. So rather than just assume a certain bias depending on uh, what we see in the wild type, maybe take mutants of this organism that have more or less bias and then really try to see what how the system responds. But I think it's really just that recognition that even a very small change in the internal symmetry, if you like, is enough to generate a much larger asymmetry, uh, a larger macroscopic asymmetry as a result of how the organism interacts with its surroundings. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a good point. So I guess this gets to the question of, you know, is, is our trajectories, our movement trajectories really ergodic, right? So can we just look at a population versus if we just look at a single organism over, over time and does it have memory? Um, I think it's important to just start with the simplest possible assumptions and then add complexity and see if that's sufficient to explain your phenomena, but um, if not, then maybe we need to add memory. But I think there is definitely evidence, for example, uh, if you start to um, rapidly dynamically change the lighting condition, you start to see that the cell definitely retains a memory of the previous illumination condition. So there is memory in that sense, but at which scale do you incorporate that into a model is not very clear at the moment. Um, so can the next speaker set up while um, Caroline asks her question? The next speaker, Astrid. Sorry. Um, um, sorry, sorry, I missed the, missed most of the question. Ah, yes. Um, so that that question has been asked before, <laughs> and and but it was, I, I guess the study, the, the previous studies may not have been um, maybe as systematic. Uh, so the conclusions back then were no, it doesn't seem to be correlated to shape. They also checked things like size; doesn't seem to be correlated to size. But how closely did they check? As in, is it enough just to take some cells and look at it and do a tra trajectory? Um, because you need to sort of really. Have, have robust measures uh, if you're going to compare one type of motility with another. Um, but I think, yeah, it's something that we, we are planning to revisit, um, just to answer that question again, or attempt to answer that question again. Let's thank Christy again. Thank you.